Well, good morning, everybody. And as ever, I'd like to begin by thanking Hans and Gulchin for their great goodness in having invited me back here again. I haven't quite managed all 18 of the PFS conferences, but I have managed a very great majority of them. And I do regret, I did regret, and I still do regret that I was not able to be here last year. Indeed, before I begin my main talk, I think I should draw attention to something. You may have noticed a rather large and I would suggest a pleasing change in my appearance during the past few years. The reason for this is that last August I had a toothache. It was a bad toothache. I don't handle pain very well, I'm afraid. And so, while I was waiting to get a dental appointment, something not always easily achieved in modern England, I began to take large doses of painkillers, and I was perhaps a little undiscriminating in my self-medication. One evening, I found some codeine in the cupboard, and I took some, which was lovely, so I took more. And then I passed out and stopped breathing, and my wife and the ambulance drivers all believed that I'd had a stroke or a heart attack. Fortunately, I'd had neither. I'd taken an overdose of codeine, but there was then about a month of tests, tests and tests and tests, at the end of which the doctor said that I was in apparently perfect health. However, For a man of my advancing years, carrying perhaps a little more weight than was good for him, I was advised that I should try to lose a little, otherwise I might develop diabetes. The doctors caught me in a moment of weakness, and so yes, I decided to lose a little weight, and that was a year ago. And I hope that I shall remain healthy for a long time yet to come. So enough of that. Let's begin the, the main subject, which I will talk about. Not me, but the fall of the Roman Republic. And there is one of my artificial intelligence masterpieces. If you haven't guessed what that is, it is Caesar crossing the Rubicon. So long as he stayed north of the Rubicon, he was not a traitor, he was simply a wanted criminal as far as the Roman authorities were concerned. The moment he crossed that river into Italy at the head of his army, he was a traitor. And the great civil war had begun from which Caesar would emerge victorious and after which we can say that the Roman Republic was dead. The fall of the Roman Republic is, of course, a matter of the greatest interest to those of the American persuasion among us, because they consider themselves to be the modern Romans. Their constitution owes much to their understanding of Roman constitutional experience. The Americans are always talking about Rome, the fall of the Republic, the fall of the Empire, and so this is a matter of continuing interest to them. And of course, it is a matter of continuing interest to almost everybody. Look, there is the most famous assassination in history. You have a painting from 1888 and a woodcut manuscript illustration from 1474. It hardly needs any of those helpful blue boxes that I've put against the images, you look at that and you know that this is the assassination of Julius Caesar. This being said, I will not talk about the details of the fall of the Republic. I won't talk about the land reform measures of the Bracchus brothers or about the wickedness of Sulla and Marius. I won't talk about the ambition of Caesar or the probable stupidity of Cicero, partly because these are all very well known and partly because they would involve me in a very long discussion for which we don't have time. Uh, 
What I want to do is to look at the underlying causes that led Rome from that story on the left, the story of Cincinnatus. For those of you who don't know, in 458 BC, the Roman Republic was hard pressed by its enemies. The Senate used its constitutional powers and appointed a dictator. They chose old Cincinnatus. They couldn't find him, but at last they found him supervising the plowing of his fields outside the city. They told him, you're the dictator you are. You've got six months of unaccountable supreme power. Save the Republic. So Cincinnatus put on his toga, walked into the city, rounded up every able-bodied man he could find, went out, defeated the enemy, and 15 days later, walked into the Senate and said, I've done the job, the Republic saved, I'm going back to plow my fields. May not be a true story, but it's an, it's an inspiring story. And then on the right, there is an image of Augustus, the first of those divine rights military dictators whom we call the emperors. I want to talk about the underlying causes that led from one of those images to the other of those images. And to move away from pretty pictures, here is a schematic diagram showing the constitution of the Roman Republic. I'll make these slides available to anyone who wants them later on. I'll put them on a website somewhere and you can download them. But I will say that the Roman constitution was not like the American constitution. It was not written down. You could not go and read about the division of powers within the Roman state. It was a customary constitution, exactly like the British constitution. And it was always a work in progress, and the exact balance of power between these four bodies always depended on the personnel in those institutions and on the circumstances that they faced. However, for about 500 years, the Roman constitution was rather like this. There were four bodies with approximately equal powers. You have the assembly of the Roman people, not a democracy in the Greek style. It had a rather strange system of voting, but this was the sovereign law-giving body of the state. Roman citizens would turn up several times a year to elect magistrates and to ratify treaties and declarations of war and all the other business of a sovereign assembly. However, the people mostly accepted laws recommended by the Senate. But let's go from, let's go around in clockwise order, in semi-clockwise order. The assembly of the people would elect the magistrates, the consuls, the praetors, the aediles, all the various officers of the republic. Those men would serve for one year. At the end of that one year, they were co-opted into the Senate, which was not an hereditary body. It was a body made up of former magistrates, but there was a very brisk turnaround, and because sons tended to follow their fathers into politics, it amounted to an hereditary body. The Senate had no lawmaking powers, it had no tax raising powers, but it was a body of great prestige, and the Senate mostly handled things like foreign affairs. Oh, the Senate also handled the money. Without a vote from the Senate, it was illegal for the Roman state to spend any money. The Senate mostly suggested laws to the assemblies. The assemblies mostly accepted it. The tribunes were elected by the assembly and they had the power to veto any decision of any other magistrate or any other body in the Roman Republic. It was a clever, balanced constitution. Always a work in progress, but that's roughly how it worked. After the collapse of the Republic, 
This is the constitution of the Roman Empire. The emperor is the supreme the emperor is the supreme magistrate, the supreme authority in the state. The emperor is the head of the bureaucracy, he is the commander in chief of the armed forces, and he is the head of the concilium, the council. The emperor also appoints the senate. The emperor rules until he dies or is murdered, and then another emperor is chosen in various ways. There was never an established way of choosing the next emperor. The, the emperors chose to keep the fig leaf, they chose to keep the Senate and the other magistracies of the Republic as a kind of fig leaf, and they always insisted that Rome continued to be a republic, not a monarchy. The Senate was kept on, the emperor appointed the senators. The Senate quite often had some choice in the next emperor. Again, a rather complex constitution. Again, not written down. Again, always a work in progress. But you can see just by looking at the boxes and the lines between them that there was a fundamental change in the governance of the Roman state between about 100 BC and about the birth of Christ. And I want to cover very briefly the main causes, the main underlying causes of this transformation. And briefly put, there is the fundamental cause of the transformation. There is the Roman Empire at its greatest extent you'll see that it is a vast organization. It runs from Newcastle in the north of Britain. In this particular map, it runs down to the Indian Ocean. So it runs from York to Babylon, and from Casablanca to the Crimea, if you want to be dramatic. This would even nowadays be a vast enterprise to govern, and imagine trying to govern it 2,000 years ago with an army of between 120 and 350,000 men. This kind of imperial structure shows that the constitution of a city-state in central Italy may not be entirely suited for the government of a great empire. The Roman Empire was not always as vast as it was at the death of Trajan in 117 AD. There is its approximate beginning, and there is the beginning of the decline and fall of the Republic. In 264 BC, Rome was supreme in Italy. It was not the capital city of Italy. It was the leading power in Italy. Again, a rather complex, a rather messy arrangement of alliances, direct government, and various kinds of agreement, somewhere between alliance and submission. But Rome was the dominant power in Italy. It had no ambitions outside Italy. And the Western Mediterranean was mostly dominated by the North African city-state of Carthage. You then have a war in which I believe the Greeks were one of the instrumental causes. They hated the Carthaginians, they feared the Carthaginians, they threw their lot in with the Romans, they began to work on the Romans. Oh, you be careful, those Carthaginians, they're in Sicily now, they'll soon be across the water into Italy. You mark my words, take action against these people now. After about 40 years of that, the Romans did go to war with Carthage, a giant war of 23 years, from which the Romans emerged victorious. They took the bigger islands in the western Mediterranean, but left Carthage otherwise alone. The Carthaginians didn't like that they had lost that war. They thought that they could do better next time. And so that's exactly what they tried to do. 218 BC, Hannibal, the commander-in-chief of the Carthaginian armed forces, invaded Italy. Didn't invade it in the way the Romans thought he would. 
that the Romans thought that he would try getting across the Mediterranean into Sicily and then into southern Italy. So that's where they focused all their armies and all their defense measures. And they, prepared, they were preparing to send an army to Spain and to North Africa when suddenly Hannibal burst through the northern Alpine passes at the head of an army of 50,000 men with, I think, 37 elephants. Hannibal then subjected the Romans to three catastrophic defeats, massive defeats, the greatest defeats in Roman history, most embarrassing. The Romans won that war. The Romans won because they, were, they weren't better generals than Hannibal, not until the end, but they were better strategists. They couldn't defeat Hannibal in the field in Italy. Instead, they kept a tight naval blockade of the Mediterranean and they sent an army to conquer Spain, which cut out the Carthaginian supply lines. Hannibal was in Italy for 11 years, and during that time, his forces shriveled and shriveled and shriveled. The Romans conquered Spain. They moved across the water into North Africa. At this point, the Carthaginian government's resolve crumbled, and it recalled Hannibal to defend the home city. And that was the end. The Romans won an overwhelming victory in the Second Punic War, and they became not merely the dominant power in the Western Mediterranean, but the hegemonic power. Indeed, they became the dominant power in the Mediterranean as a whole. It was a glorious victory for the Romans. However, victory always comes at a cost. And the cost of victory in the Second Punic War was the total devastation of Italy. 400 cities, often rather large flourishing cities, were destroyed. We don't have statistics on the number of people who died, but we do have some fragmentary statistics given in the relevant books of Livy. The number of Roman citizens before the Second Punic War was 270,000. Only halfway through the Second Punic War, while Hannibal was still in Italy, the number of Roman citizens was down to 137,000. That gives you some idea of the catastrophe visited upon Italy. And when I talk about these hundreds of thousands of Roman citizens, I'm talking about the adult male heads of households. You must add in the women, the children, the slaves, the various attached workers who suffered in the same way as the Roman citizen head of their household. You may be looking at over a million dead. You may be looking at somewhat more than a million dead. Italy was devastated. A third of the land had reverted from farmland to wasteland. Now, ancient birth rates were very high, and so long as the Malthusian ceiling itself wasn't falling due to some change in the climate, these disastrous falls in population tended to reverse themselves after three generations at the most, so that there was no scar left in the, as far as the demography of the country was concerned. And Italy did recover its population over the 50 years after the end of the Second Punic War in 201 BC. However, the Italy that recovered was now a fundamentally different Italy from the Italy that people had known for many centuries beforehand. There is another of my artificial intelligence generated images. I use these quite a lot because the copyright libraries are growing very imperious. And quite often, if you want an image, you'll find that it's copyright. If you can't get it from Wikipedia and you don't have it in your own files, it's best nowadays if you generate your own, otherwise you'll start receiving these deeply irritating emails from copyright libraries demanding money. Although I tend to tell them rather sharply to go away, it's still a nuisance having to deal with these people. 
However, never mind the provenance of this image. This is an idealized version of life in Italy before the Second Punic War, where the Roman citizens or the citizens of the subject or allied states. Most of the people in Italy were various kinds of small freehold farmer. Families had owned their land, not more than a few acres in many cases, three acres and a cow. They'd owned this land for many generations. And in those days, three or four generations was as good as immemorial. And they worked their land. And broadly speaking, they were content with what they had. There was slavery. It's not something to be airbrushed from the record. But it was one or two slaves per household a minority of people who worked alongside the other members of the family. And although slavery is always an evil, the evil that it was slavery was much mitigated by its social circumstances. There were ruling classes. There were wealthy people. There was the senatorial aristocracy in Rome. But these people were not gigantically rich. They were distinguished from other small freeholders by the fact that their land holdings were larger, they were closer to Rome, and so they were easier to reach by walking out of the city, and these people had nicer houses in Rome, and they had their nice ancestral records and their collections of wax death masks, and they had the domination of the Roman state. But there was no great jarring difference between rich and poor in Italy before the Second Punic War. Rome itself was a city of about 30,000, maybe 50,000 people. It was a city of consumption and of administration. Probably the majority of the population lived in Rome, but walked out of Rome every morning to dig in their fields, or they would live in Rome for part of the time, but for part of the time they'd live 30 or 40 miles away in little huts while they were working on their land. That was Rome, and that was most of the other cities in Italy. The Greek-speaking cities in the south, oh, those were large and luxurious, but the south was rather distant from northern and central Italy, which was the center of power in Italy in those days. Hannibal's invasion at the head of those 50,000 men and his 37 elephants and his 11 years of ruthless war with Rome ripped that Italy to pieces. And it could never be put back together again because the new Italy that emerged at the end of the Second Punic War was fundamentally different. The greatest difference was that third of the land of Italy, which had reverted to wasteland because its owners had been murdered or chased away, or they had been dispossessed in various ways. The Roman state had financed its long and desperate war with Carthage, and this was a long and desperate war, entirely comparable to one of the great two wars of the 20th century, for year after year, the Romans had needed to maintain large fleets in the Mediterranean and also large armies fighting their way through Spain and North Africa. The Romans had financed their war effort by lavish borrowing. At the end of that war, the Roman state was bankrupt. It was unable to pay its debts. The solution to this was that the Roman state offered it's, shall I call them bondholders? It's a little anachronistic. It offered the bondholders, as a token of good faith, leases, indefinite leases on the public land of Italy at very low rents. The idea was that the, the bondholders would receive these indefinite leasehold interests in the abandoned land of Italy 
and they would hold it at a nominal rent until such time as the Roman state was in a position to repay its war debts. At the end of 50 years, the value of this public land was much, much greater than anybody had expected. The grandsons of the original bondholders did not want the repayment of those debts. It was very happy to write off the debts as long as it kept the land. But you see, a third of the land of Italy was now in the hands of a very small class of very rich men. And these men were not content with holding on to a third of the land of Italy. They wanted more of it. And so they began to press their poorer freehold neighbors. You know perfectly well that if you're rich enough and if you have the right legal advice, you can get anyone out of any property. And that's what they began to do. They began to, they began to pick holes in title documents and evict people from their ancestral lands. They, they tricked people into the sale of their land. They sent gangs of armed slaves and intimidated their smaller neighbors into a fraudulent transfer. Whatever methods they used, and none of them was particularly clean, the, this group of very rich men soon engrossed at least 40%, maybe half, maybe 60% of the land in Italy. And where did, the, where did the original owners, where did the original occupiers of that, of that land go? They went off to the cities. They went off to live in places like Rome and Naples and Milan. Rome expanded from a rather small city of not more than 50,000 people to the second largest city in the Mediterranean world about 500,000, by the end of the Republic, about 750,000. And Rome was stuffed with poor people, desperately poor people, unable to work, unwilling to work. They lived in blocks of flats, apartment blocks, rather like these. You may look at these images and say, oh, those are rather nice, wouldn't take note of one of those myself. And they do look rather pretty. But you need to bear in mind, they didn't have lifts, they didn't have running water, they were often cheaply built, timber and mud brick. They could collapse very easily. And in the 60s AD, the lot burned down. People lived in these blocks of flats, sometimes three or four families living in a single room. And as I said, no running water, none of the amenities that we take for granted. Desperately poor, hanging on the generosity, the calculated generosity of the wealthy class in Rome, willing to sell their votes to the highest bidder. So you have the transformation of Italy from a land of small peasant freeholders to a series of increasingly gigantic cities occupied by what we would identify as an underclass, a sub-proletariat. For those people at the top, it was wonderful. All that money, all those pretty statues, big houses, education in Greece, all of the niceties of life. But for ordinary people, the only joy was when you got seriously drunk. You then have the riches of the East. When Rome emerged victorious from the Second Punic War, as I said, it was the, it was the dominant power in the Mediterranean world. Ever since the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, the Eastern Mediterranean and its hinterland had been dominated by Greek kingdoms endemically at war with each other. In the second century BC, they generally stopped going to war with each other. Instead, they took their territorial disputes before the Roman Senate. They weren't always looking for a purely judicial settlement of those differences. It wasn't like taking your case before a world court in the modern world. 
No, they would turn up in Rome, the Eastern ambassadors, well laden with boxes of gold, and they would bribe decisions out of the Senate. There is a picture, let's have a look, there's a picture of Ptolemy Auletes, the father of Queen Cleopatra. He was known as the greatest bribe master of his age. When he was kicked out of Alexandria in some family coup, he took himself off to Rome and he bribed. He bribed with lavish hand. Indeed, when he ran out of ready money with which to bribe the senators, he bribed with promissory notes and an army of Roman debt collectors descended on Egypt the moment he had been put back into Alexandria. Vast amounts of money sucked out of the Eastern Mediterranean into the hands of this small, vastly enriched senatorial aristocracy. You then have the money from war booty, you have the money from war indemnities, you have a general enrichment of the possessing classes in Rome and in Italy in general, and at the same time, you have the wholesale impoverishment of the ordinary people. That makes a limited Republican constitution rather difficult to maintain, but it's made rather worse than that. One of the problems of an empire is that if your own country is a constitutional if your own country has a constitutional order, if you are the citizen of a constitutional republic and you're also in possession of an overseas empire, there is a difficulty of integration. If you're the subject of an absolute monarchy, if you're the subject, if you're the subject of the king of Persia and the king of Persia invades Egypt and takes it over, it's easy. He simply appoints his brother-in-law as the governor of Egypt, and things carry on much as before. But if a constitutional republic picks up foreign possessions, <coughs> how do you integrate the government of this empire into the government of your own country? That is a problem that all empires have wrestled with that were not absolute monarchies. The Romans because they were the first people to face this difficulty, chose a particularly stupid solution. The Romans had the cursus honorum, a course of offices. You're a well-born young man, and you want to reach the top. You want to become one of the consuls for the year, and then you want to join the Senate. And so, you start at the bottom getting yourself elected to this office. You discharge that office for a year. You're then eligible to move on to the next round of elections, rather like a game show. And eventually you work your way to the top. You do this because you're driven by a sense of family pride. Your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, those are all consuls, so why shouldn't you be? or you're driven by a sense of your own great abilities. Only you can save the Republic in its moment of danger. Whatever, or perhaps you're driven by simple self-glory. But those are all, in various ways, creditable motives for engaging in politics. However, once you add an empire to this system, it becomes radically different. The idea now was that once you have served your year as a consul or a praetor, once you have served your year as one of the elected magistrates of the Republic in the city of Rome, you will be appointed as the governor of one of the empire's provinces. You may be given North Africa, you may be given Greece, you may be given Spain or southern France, you may be given, oh, you may be given something rather nice. You will, for one year or five years, or how, however long is decided by the Senate, be, you may enjoy 
absolute and unaccountable power in your province. If you are so inclined, you can ruthlessly extort money from the locals. You can do anything you like. You can take bribes. You can steal. You can do all sorts of beastly things. Even without doing that, even without openly soliciting bribes, you can come back loaded with gifts from grateful provincials, because the provincials are often very grateful when they found a governor who didn't steal from them or murder them on a large scale, and so they would reward him with very generous gifts on his departure. However you behaved in your province, you could come back immensely enriched by the experience. Now, once you add that to the top of the constitutional system, you change the entire constitution. People are no longer interested in running for office because it is the family custom or because I have particular abilities that are of service to the state. No, you run for office and you serve out your year looking after the drains of the libraries in Rome. You do it, you put up with it, you put up with shaking hands of people who stink of garlic, because you know that at the end of that year, you can go and govern Greece, and you can restore all of the family fortunes that your stupid grandfather gambled away. Now that means that it is it is vital that you should secure election, and to do that, you will bribe the people into voting for you. You also bribe your own followers, the people you maintain on your own charity, to go and break up the meetings of your rivals. Elections, meetings of the assembly and elections of magistrates degenerated into riots and sometimes into small civil wars. You then have the growth of various radical movements which want a resumption of those public lands and their redistribution to the city poor. You have a strong resistance from the possessing classes, not excluding even murder of radical politicians. And you have the beginning of a downward spiral from constitutional government to absolute power by a divine right military dictator. So what lesson do we take from this? The lesson we take from it is that if you want to live in a limited constitutional system, there are two things that you should do your absolute best to avoid. The first is large-scale war, and the second is the acquisition of a large empire. Did I really need to spend half an hour talking about the Roman Republic, though, to make you aware of those two truths? I don't think I did. But, I, but I'm afraid I've done so. Now, if you... If you want to read more on this, I've provided a bibliography which contains the main modern popular accounts of the transformation of Rome from republic to empire. I will also make these slides available to anyone who wants them, either as a PowerPoint set or as a PDF. It may be best if you give, your email, if you give me your email address, I can email them to you, or if you bring me a memory stick, or Perhaps Stefan can put them on the PFS website, I don't know. But it will all be available. So thank you for your indulgence. I have been asked to speak again tomorrow on a subject of greater relevance, and I shall try to keep that from being of explosive relevance. But for the moment, thank you very much.